Mr. Milch, thank you very much. Corianne, thank you for including me in this gathering. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for being with us. I, um, I believe fervently in the work that Consource is doing. I believe fervently in the wonderful uh, progress we're making with the publication of the Founding Fathers papers, due in large part to the Pew Foundation. And I applaud also the wonderful work of Gilbert Lehrman Institute uh, and their representatives of those worthy organizations here tonight, too, to my great pleasure. I, um, I've had a very busy summer. When a new book comes out and the publisher believes in it, they send you off on the author's tour roller coaster ride. And uh, my wife and I have covered some 12 cities. We've spoken in all kinds of gatherings and signed books in all kinds of huge bookstores and uh, seen a lot of our fellow Americans in a summer of much discontent and heat and floods and fires and um, and it's been very reassuring and I feel frequently that what we are bombarded with on television while often accurate in effect uh, this cumulative effect is very mis misleading because the big news is always or not nearly always bad news and there's a great deal of very good news in our country. People care about education. People care passionately about education. People care about books, about the written word. And this was brought home wonderfully just this past weekend when we went to a little town in Maine called Searsport, which is uh, along the coast, uh, doesn't uh, have any importance in the history of our country or Maine, as much to speak of. And there's a little bookstore there called Left Bank Books, run by a wonderful woman named Marcia Kaplan. It's tiny. You could put three of Left Bank Books shops on this stage. And uh, there it is, surviving. Against all the odds, against all the trends, against all predictions about what's happening to the printed page. And uh, because my new book, The Greater Journey, is set in Paris and about Paris, I thought, I must go to Left Bank Books. And sure enough, we got there, and I'd been there before, but they decorated the shop with scenes from Paris. It was very picturesque and very appropriate, I felt. And uh, at one point, when there was a lull in the signing ceremonies, I asked the people there, Mrs. Kaplan and others, how did you get the name for this bookstore? She said, well, there was a bank and it left. So they picked up where the bank left off, and so far they're doing very well. Now what struck me so about that place is that was the quality of the selections they were offering. They only had so much space so they could only offer books that they felt really mattered, books that they felt were worthy of a reader's attention. And that, of course, is a big part of education. What do we read? What do we take to heart? What do we take heart from? I have devoted my working life to writing the history of our country. And I have evolved feelings about the meaning of history and the importance of history as time has progressed. And I, and I care a lot about the lessons of history. And the lessons of history, of course, are manifold. And I care about what do we get from history. Well, I think history is a source of strength. 
I think history is an antidote to the hubris of the present, the idea that we know everything, that we are the most terrific people ever to walk the earth, the idea that we have the most worthy projects or we have suffered the most uh, inconveniences or, or terrifying moments and so forth. Uh, history, I think, um, is an aid to navigation in troubled times, turbulent times. And I think it's a source of great inspiration. And it's endlessly interesting because it's human. It's about people, which we are reminded of specifically in the first lines of the two most important documents in our whole way of life, not just our government. When in the course of human events, that's the operative word, human events, we, the people. And that is of the utmost importance to understand. Many of the greatest accomplishments in our story as a people have come out of the darkest, most difficult, troubled times, the most worrisome times, the most contentious of times, including the constitution of our country. Most people don't understand that. They think we fought the Revolutionary War, we won the war, we wrote the constitution and we were on our way. It didn't happen like that. And it wouldn't have happened the way it happened had it been a different atmosphere at the moment. The summer of 1787 was a troubled, turbulent time. We were in big trouble financially, individually, as human beings, as citizens, and, and as states, and as a country. We had a huge debt to France, incapable of paying. The, the government was incapable of raising the money to run itself, the government under the Articles of Confederation. Individual people were in debt. There was a crop failure through much of the country. There was an uprising in Western Massachusetts, Shays Rebellion. I know you all read about Shays Rebellion in school. Shays Rebellion was real. And it sent a tremor through the whole country. Worry, we're on the brink of something really serious. And we were. So 55 men met in Philadelphia in the same room where the Declaration of Independence was hatched and signed, same room, and again as with the Declaration of Independence, in secret, they shut the windows so no one could listen at the windows, put sentries at the windows so no one could listen. In the heat of a Philadelphia summer, Imagine enduring that because they wanted no political grandstanding. They wanted no version of 18th century sound bites coming out of those windows. They didn't want sound bite brains at work in there. They wanted hard, conscientious, clear thinking by people devoted to accomplish something worthy that will stand the test of time. Hard, hard work. They were surprisingly young. Over half were under 40. Benjamin Franklin was the wise old man. He was present. George Washington was the president of the convention, sat at the head of the room, did not say a great deal, but his sheer presence was of the utmost importance, his gravitas. Brilliant people, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, James Wilson. And they did it. They created, yes, the bicameral legislature, yes, the executive office, yes, the Supreme Court. They created the national government. The Constitution is about the national government. And they created a document which has stood the test of time. Yes, it has been amended. Yes, its Bill of Rights is of the essence. But the Bill of Rights, by the way, has never been amended. It was a crowning achievement 
not crown of gold, not crown of gold and jewels, a crown of words on paper. Words matter. Words count. We have words to live by, words to rein reinstate our faith in what we're about. No other constitution like it ever before. It was an American original achievement. And it was a group effort, a combined effort, a combined effort, people working together. Adam, or Madison was often given great credit for the Constitution. He said, no, no, many hands, many heads. Of the utmost importance is that lesson. And we can't be reminded of it enough, and particularly right now. I, um, I feel very strongly, too, that one of the lessons of history is that very little of consequence is ever accomplished alone. I write a book, my name's on the book. Look at the list of people that I acknowledge in my acknowledgments section, which every author with any conscience does. Those are people who really helped, who really made the difference. We are a combined effort, we the American people. And it's by working together and having a, a common sense of shared values that holds us fast. We need symbols of affirmation. Human beings need them. We need them especially. We heard about the symbol of affirmation so beautifully performed just now. And the flag was still there. The flag, a symbol of affirmation through the perilous fight not through happy, peaceful times, through the perilous fight. The capital of the dome on this magnificent acropolis of ours here in Washington, D built during the Civil War, there was great movement to stop construction of it. Lincoln said, no, it must go on because of its importance to the country. I think of the Brooklyn Bridge rising up of, out of the greed and political corruption, the rotten swamp of the Gilded Age, a magnificent symbol of affirmation, still standing, still a tribute to what human ingenuity and a sense of architectural splendor can do when combined together by people united in a worthy project. And that's exactly what the Constitution is. Now, when something succeeds and it replaces something that has failed, it's very common to think that what succeeded is all terrific and admirable, and let's move on to another subject, and that what failed can go to the dust heap. The same summer as the signing of the Constitution, what the Congress that was then in session, the Congress that was our government, passed the Northwest Ordinance. Northwest Ordinance is one of the most interesting and important documents in our whole story. The Northwest Ordinance set aside a territory for development as states for five states, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Five states, a territory bigger than all of France. Think of that. And declared, among other things, there would be no slavery before we even had a constitution and that education would be required, would be, the, would be the duty of the government, of the states. An amazing accomplishment. And oh, oh, that they had succeeded in doing that with the Constitution. Martin Luther King, in, a, uh, in his great speech here on the Mall, said that the Constitution was a promissory note, hadn't done its job. So the Articles of Confederation wasn't always a failure. The Articles of Confederation, as weak as that was, got us through eight and a half years of war, the longest war in our history 
except for Vietnam, the Revolutionary War, the most costly war in our history, in lives lost on a per capita basis, except for the Civil War. It was no easy proposition ever at the beginning, including the summer of 1787. But they did it. They succeeded. And we're all the beneficiaries. And how can we possibly turn our backs on that? How can we be so steeped in ingratitude that we don't care, that we don't teach our children and our grandchildren about these accomplishments and what they mean? But they just didn't fall out of the sky. People had to get together and do it in adversity, in troubled, difficult times. We're not doing a very good job of educating our children. It's a strange situation. We have the greatest universities in the world, but at the same time, our education at the lower levels is failing badly. And we are, alas, raising generations of young Americans who are by and large historically illiterate. I know, I know, I know from experience, lecturing, teaching on campuses in every part of the country for more than 25 years. And it's not the fault of the students. And that's why projects like this, programs like this, are so extremely important. Not just for the benefit of the students, but for the teachers, and for the parents, and for the grandparents. Education truly does begin at home. These old adages, call them cliches, are true, and we need to be reminded of that. Now, the founding father that I know the most about is John Adams. John Adams did not attend the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. He was serving his country as ambassador to Great Britain. Jefferson was not there. He was serving as minister to France. Adams immediately wrote to say, after getting the news about the Constitution, which he was thrilled by, that it needed a Bill of Rights. Jefferson said nothing about that for quite some time, uh, but eventually saw that that too was necessary. But Adams is particularly pertinent to this whole subject because he was the author of a very important clause in the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which was written eight years before our national constitution. No such clause had ever been written for a constitution. He was sure that it would be, it would be voted down, never had a chance to get into the constitution. Turned out they didn't change a word. It's still the law of the state. And I want to read to you, in closing my remarks, what it says. Because I think it bears directly on why we are here tonight, and directly on the job we have to do. Those of us who are citizens, those of us who are teachers, those of us who are members of Congress, we have to do something about the quality of education in our country. We've got to learn to, to cultivate an attitude in the nation which, which will cherish learning the love of learning, the reverence for learning is the essence of what we're about in this society, this civilization. Any nation that expects to be ignorant and free expects what never was and never will be, Thomas Jefferson. And now let me read you what the extraordinary John Adams wrote in 1779. The war was still going on. Wisdom and knowledge as well as virtue diffused generally among the body of the people, is utterly necessary for the preservation of their rights and liberties. And as these depend on the spreading opportunities and advantages of education in the various parts of the country and among the different orders of the people, education will be for everybody. It shall be the duty of legislators and magistrates in all future periods of this commonwealth 
to cherish the interests of literature and the sciences in all public schools, grammar schools, to promote opportunities and rewards, promotion of agriculture, arts, sciences, commerce, trades, manufacturings, natural history of the country, everything. No barriers, no, no categories, everything. To countenance and inculcate the principles of humanity and general benevolence, public and private charity, industry and frugality, honesty, sincerity, good humor. There will be good humor. It's in the Constitution of Massachusetts. <laughs> and all social affections and generous sentiments among the people. Now, it was in all a declaration of Adam's faith in education as the bulwark of the great society. The old shining faith. And the survivals and rights and liberties of the people dependent on the spreading of wisdom and knowledge, he wrote. He was a farmer's son. But then he said to himself earlier in life, and he said it to him all of his long life. These wonderful lines from his diary. I must judge for myself. But how can I judge? How can anyone judge unless his mind has been opened and enlarged by reading? Reading. Books. Learning. That's our mission. That's the mission of this organization, Concourse. And it ought to be a cause we welcome with joy. On we go. Wonderful. Now, Mr. McCullough, I heard once upon a time you say that there are only two ways that we can interact with our founding fathers, one through their documents and two by visiting their houses. So we have gotten you a book on the houses of the founding fathers, and it is signed by several of the members of Congress in attendance tonight. If you are a member of Congress and you have not signed it for David McCullough and expressed your uh, wishes to him in this book, I invite you to do this afterwards. But we would give this to you as an expression of our thanks. What a wonderful gift. Thank You're you. You're very, very welcome. welcome. Now, if we can get the house lights up, he's agreed to take questions. And we have two microphones on either side. So we would invite anyone who has a question to come up. And um, we will delay the ending of this program for just a bit to entertain your questions. Uh, thank you very much. Roger Wicker from Mississippi. Lamar Alexander and I believe you when, uh, when you say that, that we have a generation of Americans who are ignorant of, uh, of history. And, and uh, you came and testified before a Senate committee when I was a member of the House and when Lamar and I introduced legislation. Uh, for a teacher's academy of very modest steps toward addressing that. But convince me, if you will, that, that there was a time when it was better among the rank and file of Americans. Uh, I mean, I, I look back at the sweatshops and I look back at the history of uh, when we didn't have universal education. I look back at the time when members of the Senate were elected by legislators rather than by the people themselves and, and convince us, if you will, sir, that there was a time when we did it better 
and perhaps make a suggestion as to how we could get back to that time? Well, there was certainly inequality in education, not just cutting across uh, economic status, but also regional parts of the country. Uh, I have looked at the uh, examinations given at high schools in western Missouri at the time when Harry Truman was a student in high school. And I don't think there are very many seniors in our best universities who could pass those tests. I think that's pretty good evidence. I have read um, the pronouncements about the importance of history written by his high school history teacher, who was his favorite teacher. Truman is the only president of our time who never went to college, but he also read more, and particularly history and biography, than all but a few presidents. Um, I also know from my own experience, I went to public school in Pittsburgh in the 19, late 1930s, early 1940s, and we knew more American history when we finished eighth grade than a freshman at uh, Princeton or Dartmouth knows today. I don't think there's any question about it. I know from experience in teaching these, being with these young people. Now, they know an awful lot that we never knew. That's not the point. It's not their intelligence. It's not their intellectual curiosity. It's just they haven't been taught. And I think, to a large extent, this has to do with parents not participating sufficiently, We've got to talk to our children about more than just sports and what's on television. We've got to take them to historic places, historic sites. It works like nothing else does. And we've got to encourage them to read those books at their stage in life that have moved us, that excited us, that changed our outlook when we were their age. And it works. It all works. And we have got not just to pay our teachers better, but we've got to respect their work and, and give them the public recognition and appreciation that they deserve. They are doing the most important work of anybody in our society, and they don't get sufficient recognition for that. And I speak again from personal experience. I have a son who teaches in public high school. I know what they go through. And, um, and we need to do a better job of educating them before they assume the responsibility of teaching. I am opposed to the idea of majoring in education. This is a long answer, but I really care about this. Uh, uh, I oppose the idea of people who are going into teaching majoring in education and not having a subject that they major in. Because it's very hard to teach something effectively if you don't know it. You're trying to teach mathematics or physics or history and you have no experience in it. The greatest teachers that we've all had in our lives, the teachers that have changed our lives, we've all had them, are those who loved what they were teaching. They convey that enthusiasm. And uh, you can't love something you don't know any more than you can love someone you don't know. So we should go, the uh, State University of Illinois at Normal, still requires their education students to have a major. They can major in education, but they have to major in math or English literature, or whatever it is. So I say back to normal. Um, <laughs> that's the way to do it. Thank you. Another question. And government support. Government support here in this capital. In these debates, and in the questions asked for many of the candidates, nobody's talking about education, hardly at all. And yet, I assure you, I've been talking to audiences for years, everywhere in the country. Every time I talk about what we just brought up, there's avid interest, applause, and concern. It is nationwide, as it should be, as it should be. We all want our children and grandchildren to have a better advantage, a better education, a better foundation than we have. It's all, it runs through the whole story of our country. One of my favorite buildings in this, in the country is the little 
Carpenters Hall in Philadelphia, right down the street from Independence Hall. Tiny, wonderful little building where the first Congress met. Right upstairs is what? A library. Yes, sir. I, um, <clears throat> maybe the House should get equal time after the, uh, the, the Senate. Um, I want to commend you for doing what very few good historians do, and that is writing your history from original sources. Thank you. The, uh, we just founded uh, a few months ago uh, the Archives Caucus uh, for the purpose of trying to portray to the American people that the best historical knowledge is obtained by looking at the original sources. And as we went through, I went through uh, the greater journey, and I shared with you that I have the seat that Elihu Washburn uh, held uh, before he became the ambassador uh, to France. I was absolutely thrilled with the way you wove in the Franco-Prussian War and the characters over 70 years. It's, it's probably one of the greatest books that I've read in my entire life. Well, sir, I thank you. That with you. <coughs> Let me just add one point to that. One of the most exciting <laughs> discoveries of my working life was the discovery of the diary kept by Elihu Washburn, a member of Congress from Galena, Illinois, friend of Abraham Lincoln's, whom Grant appointed minister to Paris right before the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War. They didn't know the Franco-Prussian War was going to happen. And we've just discovered within the last four years that I worked on the book that his diary, a diary he kept through the entire siege of Paris, through the, all the horrors of the commune, the civil war, the god-awful civil war that followed the siege of Paris, he kept the diary every single day. And that diary has now been found because a copy of it, a letterpress copy, which was the 19th century equivalent of carbon paper, was in the Library of Congress, right here. And nobody knew it. So it's not just that everything is in the Library of Congress or the National Archives, and anybody can go and get it. There are all kinds of things in the National Archives and in the Library of Congress that even the people at the Library of Congress don't know are there. <laughs> and that's what makes it so exciting. And this document is testimony to a, an American hero who ought to be known by everybody for what he did, his bravery, his devotion to his duty. At the terrible risk of his life and jeopardy of putting his family and everybody else in jeopardy. If he'd done nothing but keep the diary, he would be somebody we'd want to know about. That's what makes this work so exciting. It's what makes it's, it's about learning. It's about curiosity. It's about it's being on the detective chase, the hunt. And the more you look, the more you find. I've never undertaken a book where we didn't find something new. Never. Sometimes big, sometimes many small pieces, but always something new. And, 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 the, and the, the legendary trunk full of letters up in the attic is real. It's true. It happens all the time. We don't write letters anymore. We don't dare keep diaries if we're in public life. <laughs> Truly, it's a terrible loss. Now, Pat, don't leave just because I'm getting onto that sense of subject. <laughs> Keep going. I'm listening. No, I'm finished, pal. Thank you. No, I, I love what you're saying about the diary. I've tried to keep a journal since I've been to the Senate, and I've sometimes neglectful, and I made a note to myself where you were speaking, I gotta get back in shape. David, you and I first met when we had the uh, debate over Panama Canal Treaty. And I would say to the others, here, you just written path between the seas. And I remember people like Howard Baker and others say, we gotta read that. By the time the debate started, for those of you who weren't here at that time, Every single senator had on his desk path between the seas. Those vehemently against the treaty, those for the treaty, and those trying to figure out what the hell they're going to do next. 
but that was the Bible. I couldn't help but think, with all due respect to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, it was the first time some of them had really read a lot of history. And I, I really wish we could take a month off a year and just have history seminars like you spoke tonight. Uh, my family came to Vermont in the 1800s. I was the first Leahy to get a college degree. My father, because my grandfather died in the stone sheds, had to leave school at 13, became a self-taught historian. Probably read more books of history than just about anybody I know and told us we have to read history. I wish we could, this is not a question, but I've heard you lecture so many times that I get excited every time I do. I wish we could take time out from the Congress, House and Senate, both parties, just have seminars in history. Because in our news media and everything else, everybody wants to put it down to a bumper sticker, simplistic answer, and there are none. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. I, I'm going to stop now, but I want to conclude with a, with a story that's from the, from the Truman days. Uh, Truman was about to appoint General George Marshall to become uh, Secretary of State. And at a meeting at the White House, one of his political advisors, I'm not sure which one it was, it doesn't really matter, advised him to think twice about it. And the President asked why, and he said, well, Mr. President, if you make George Marshall Secretary of State, after three or four months, people might begin to say that he would make a better President than you are. And Harry Truman said, he would make a better president than I am. <laughs> but I'm the president of the United States, and I want the best possible people in these important positions. There's a man who knew who he was, who wasn't afraid of being upstaged, and uh, who made exactly the right decision. He had a sense of history very profound sense of history. When George Marshall took office as Secretary of State, he was asked at a press conference if he'd had a good education at VMI, Virginia Military Institute. He said, no, I didn't. He said, why not, sir? We had no history. Teaching a seminar at one of our most noted universities, the first morning, I asked my students, 25 of them, all honor students, all seniors, all history majors, who was George C. Marshall? Not one of them knew. Finally, one boy said, did he maybe have something to do with the Marshall Plan? Five or six years later, I asked the same question for a similar group of students an equally prestigious institute of higher learning. Same result. Not long afterward, I asked the same question at a small, very good college in the Middle West. Not quite the same result. Some of them knew who he was. But alas, more of them said he must have been the man who invented or started martial law. So they not, only, they not only needed help with their history, but with their spelling. We have a job to do. We have a job to do. One third of the people in the recent survey think that the Bill of Rights includes the right to own a pet. And these kinds of answers are heartbreaking, and so we laugh. We have to laugh. But it can change. We can make it better. We should see the problem as an opportunity. Thank you very much.